Hello and welcome to this six minute audio introduction to Relighting a Very Nice Fire, a filmed theatre and performance art piece about, well it's about lots of things, you'll have to watch it and make up your own mind. I'm Megan and I'll also be audio describing the film, which lasts 54 minutes. Relighting a Very Nice Fire was filmed over three days in the gigantic basement studio of the Riverfront Theatre in Newport. Access to the studio is via a lift that opens onto a small mezzanine which narrows into a walkway about a metre wide. The walkway hugs the walls of the space in a gradual descent, ending in a short stairwell that leads down onto the studio floor. Next to the stairwell is a giant rasping air conditioning unit which grumbles behind thick black vents. The space itself is a high ceilinged cavernous rectangle. All the walls are black, apart from the mezzanine area which has been painted white and a neon mural of Fly Agaric, the classic fairy tale toadstool, which glow under a bright blue sky at the stairwell wall end. This side of the studio also features two severe looking blue pleather sofas and a floral print armchair. A scuffed black dance floor covers most of the studio space, around the edges of which rest two white trestle tables, some red plastic chairs, and a clunky metal waist high costume rail on wheels, from which hang colourful suit jackets and shirts. Theatre lights sit at different angles around the studio and cast bright light across the floor and walls. Props are minimal. A shelfless glass display cabinet around a metre and a half high is nestled in one corner of the space. A small white chunky coffee table used as a platform in a sequence and two matching rectangular plywood boards measuring 50 centimetres wide by 70 centimetres tall. These are fixed to long tripod legs with wheels at the bottom and are tall and wide enough to obscure the torso of a person standing behind. They are painted a vivid green and have two circles cut out above a letterboxed shaped hole which give the impression of leering faces. Strips of plastic hang from behind these rectangular mouth holes, a shimmering curtain of green teeth. Potatoes are a frequently used prop and are sometimes hidden within choreographed pieces. They vary from large bakers to tiny new potatoes. Some are real and some are plastic. The film is shot in colour, apart from flashbacks of rehearsals which appear in black and white. The quality of the film also changes depending on the scene. For set pieces, such as when the company play as a band or dance together, the film quality becomes sleeker, a contrast to the stark realness of the rest of the footage. There is a sequence of newsreels, adverts and political speeches which begin in the black studio space and suddenly appear glossy with a white background. Static, like this, frequently distorts the picture to mark a shift in film quality or if there is an abrupt change of scene. When Gareth talks to the camera, there is often a choreographed costume and set change happening behind him. The company is made up of six people. Gareth, Gar, G. A tall, slim, white man of around 1.85 metres or 6 foot 1 in height. He's in his mid-fifties, with a subtle gold ring in his left ear and grey hair shaved close to his head that fades to nothing on top. His neat, white goatee is flecked with auburn and bracketed by deep laughter lines. He has a steely, blue-eyed gaze which can appear severe, but is quick to sparkle with humour at any given moment. He uses large, owlish glasses when reading. Gareth wears a black t-shirt under an oatmeal coloured boiler suit and black boots. He sings and plays guitar, sometimes with a rock star pout. Jonathan, JD, the filmmaker who spends most of his time behind one of three cameras. He appears in front of the lens for a millisecond to say hello. He is shorter than Gareth and younger by about 20 years. He has shaved blonde hair with an oval face, kind blue eyes and a short ginger beard. He is wearing black. Ang Harrod is a white woman in her late 30s. She is slender in build and of average height with long, sandy blonde hair that she wears up in a loose knot. Her delicate, arching eyebrows sit over blue eyes and her flawless skin belies her age. Ang Harrod has two roles, wardrobe mistress and performer. She appears in some of the set pieces, but also in the background of shots, dressing the others. She wears a tight black t-shirt with a patch of safety pins fastened over her right breast. Her oatmeal boiler suit is worn half down, with the arms tied around her waist. Da is a neurodivergent person in their mid-fifties. The sides of their head are shaved, with a mass of tousled short hair on the back and top, dyed red and orange. They have an oval face, strong eyebrows and large bright blue eyes, heavy with liner, which stare out from behind thick rectangular glasses. Their nose is pierced with a silver ring. Da's features become fixed when they are focusing intently. They are of medium height and build 
and wear the same uniform of black t-shirt under an oatmeal boiler suit and black boots. Dar plays ukulele and synthesizer with cool concentration. Megan, Meg. In her early 40s, she is a full head shorter than Gareth and the smallest of the group. She has brown, wavy hair that she wears half up off her face, which gives the impression of a mullet as the sides of her head are clipped short. Her hazel eyes are lightly creased and set in a pale face, and her bottom lip is pierced with a silver ring. She can appear quite hard, but if she forgets herself and smiles, her features soften. She wears a black vest beneath her boiler suit. Megan plays violin animatedly. Oh, and if you think her voice sounds familiar, you're right, it's me. Dino. D. He enters the Who's Tallest competition with Gareth and wins by a few centimetres. In his early 30s, Dino is slim with short, ruffled, medium brown hair styled with a fringe that ends just above his eyebrows. His face is heart-shaped and he has a moustache and short beard which extends along his jaw. He has hooded, grey eyes, youthful pale skin and a full mouth which can form a sneer as quickly as it can a heartwarming smile. Dino wears black skinny jeans and a black t-shirt. That is the end of the audio introduction. We hope you enjoy the film. Lift doors open on Gareth Clark. His name appears in bold yellow type in front of him. The camera retreats as he advances towards us. Right, let's get this straight. Arts Council Wales gave me £10,000 to make this theatre show and film. Now they didn't just give me 10 k no, I had to apply for it. I had to fill in an application and I had to tell them how I would honour the cultural contract and it went to a panel and they decided. But that money, I guess, comes from the Welsh Government and from the National Lottery, which ultimately means this money comes from you. He points at us. Now, all right, you might be saying, what? An artist I've never heard of gets £10,000. Haven't our governments got better things to spend money on? Well, maybe they have, but that's just the game. I'm just playing the cards I've been dealt. And let me tell you, 10K for a theatre show or a film is very, very cheap. But that doesn't mean to say I'm doing everything on the cheap, no. I mean, yeah, okay, the Riverfront have given us this basement space for free with an air conditioning system that won't turn off. But it's not a cheap production, no. And that, that 10K is not going in my pocket either. Mm -mm, no, I'm working with Ang Harrod. I'm working with Dar. I'm working with Megan. They all wave or nod. And I'm working with the filmmaker, Jonathan. He waves, then goes. Yeah. And there's a load of other things to pay out for. Gareth reads from a list. Yes. Marketing, administration, audio description, editing, costume, and public liability insurance. He tosses it. We're all getting paid £650 a week for the work that we do. That's right, £650 a week. And I've got a three week stretch here. So the money that I earn probably looks a bit like this. A fan of 10s and 20s sit on a coffee table. Now that's obviously a fee I get for a project. I don't earn that every week as a freelancer. And I actually then pay tax and national insurance, the 20%, yes I do. And I pay a mortgage and I've got house insurance and then I've got my energy bills to pay out on. I've got council tax, I've got Wi-Fi and telephone and all those bills that you have got to pay as well, right? So fundamentally, I get Mubi as a subscription. And if that makes me an arty wanker, then so be it. The money has become a pile of potatoes. But once all those deductions have been taken away from a fee like that, fundamentally this is what I get left. The potatoes are swapped for a few raw chips. Now why am I telling you all this? Well, I just thought you should know. Welcome to relighting a very nice fire. The title appears in yellow as he grabs a guitar and walks behind a mic. Dar and Megan are already in situ with their instruments. Strike a match, hold the poles until it's hot. Stay in control until it falls to pieces. Watch the light take the room shining through. Lost its way. Lost its roof, lost it all This fire burns This fire burns inside This fire 
video quality of the film snaps back to stark normality as Zang Harrod wheels a costume rail across the space. The band discard their instruments. In the years preceding the pandemic, Dino Rovaretti, my friend, and I were working on a show that we were calling A Very Nice Fire. It was a theatre show. He begins to undress. And then in 2020, 2021, Dino decides to give up the arts to stop making theatre, to stop performing poetry. And he cites a need for a more stable occupation, something more normal. I don't know how that makes you feel, but to me, it felt a bit like this. Gold letters appear, devastation with Gareth Clark. Behind, Gareth is dressed in suit jacket and tie. His boiler suit falls, revealing black boxes before he sits behind a desk. Dino gets Dexit done. Dexit done, Dino gets Dexit done the Dino way. Local man Dino Ravaretti has left the arts. In a statement made in a house in Baneswell, Dino Ravaretti explained it that he needed to leave the arts to pursue a career that was more strong and stable. Dexit done Dino. Done deal Dino. Dino gets the Dexit deal done and leaves the arts. D no 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 says yes 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 to a more stable and strong career. Dexit gets Dino done. Dexit Midnight Runners spotted, leaving the arts. The arts industry is today mourning the loss of Dino Rovaretti. One man said, I cried. For more on this story, we go to our outdoor correspondent, Dr. Dar. Dar? Dar appears outside. What does Dino leaving the arts mean to you? Well, Gar, people leave the arts every single day. Um, our viewers might remember there was a government campaign a couple of years ago that was encouraging ballet dancers to become cyber security experts. That is literally true. Dino has made his choice. Of course, the concept of choice is very problematic given the very, very complicated sociological and economic context in which people make choices. But Dino seems happy enough with his choice, um, unlike you. Anyway, um, back to your news desk. Dino gets Dexit done, Dexit done, Dino gets done, Dino, Dexit done, Dino, Dexit, midnight runner, he runs from the yards, Dexit done, Dino gets Dexit done, Dino, no, don't go. Don't go Dino, heard. 
from House and Bainswell. This, Justin. He reveals a large potato. Gareth is helped out of his jacket and pulls up his boiler suit. You see, we started making a very nice fire in 2018. We were reeling from 2016 and the subsequent election results. Dino and I were sat in a Newport coffee shop and there was a huge slogan written on the wall. It was a Dylan Thomas quote and it was, when one burns one bridges, what a very nice fire it makes. These were divisive times and there was a single issue at the heart of everything. Megan sits behind a table, dressed in a blue jacket. She's flanked by Anne Carrad and Dar, who stand behind green boards. This potato wanted to remain. This potato wanted to leave. This potato is bigger than this potato. Is it? Which potato were you? You see, the future was yet to play out. The signs were there, it just wasn't obvious yet. He rushes to help make a podium by tipping the table upright. Megan sticks a Union Jack flag to the top of it. Dar pops up from behind in a green tartan jacket. News heading reads, Prime Minister Liz Truss apparently has strong opinions about potatoes. In the spring, I'll be travelling to Beijing to open up new potato markets. She fixes a wide-mouthed grin. The others stand and clap robotically. We grow more potatoes than the Canadian prairies. However, we import two thirds of our potatoes. That is a disgrace. She frowns. Liz Truss swaps her scowl for a cheesy grin, then sinks back behind the podium. 45 days that changed the UK was yet to happen. You see, back then we were still under the big seduction. At least that's what it felt like. And it didn't feel like it was new. It felt like it had been going on for years. He drops down behind a simple drawing of a freestanding bath. Bubbles rise as Megan appears naked at one end, two filthy feet sticking up at the other. And Harrod and Dar stand on chairs at each side, holding bags of smash which they sprinkle over Megan as she caresses her skin. Only the crumbliest, flakiest potato tastes like potato never tasted before. Megan's mouth is slack with euphoric ecstasy as smash rains down on her. A potato rests by a bath leg. Back in stark reality, the smash fairies dismount and take away the bath, revealing Megan kneeling awkwardly, her vest straps down, Gareth scrunched in her lap, bare feet in the air clutching a megaphone. Megan's sensual poise fades and her gaze lowers as she redresses. You see, politicians were dancing to the rhythm of their own rhetoric. Uh-huh. Check this out. He ducks behind an upright table which Dar is standing in front of. Megan walks into shot dressed in a fuchsia blazer. Dar is past potatoes from behind the table which they keep dropping as the frequency increases. News headline reads, Theresa May spouts strong and stable waffle. We need strong and stable leadership. A strong economy that comes from a strong and stable government. Any deal requires a strong and stable understanding of the complex issues involved. Any vote for me is a vote for strong and stable. This country needs strong and stable leadership. Strong and stable. Strong and potato. Potato and potato. Potato, 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 potato. Megan nods to herself approvingly. Dar gives up on the potatoes and leaves. Words were being rattled around. It was painfully choreographed and constantly regurgitated. I began to think that it was completely obvious, but then I tried to see it from somebody else's point of view. Dar takes the space dressed in a black tailcoat. They appear very serious. The shiny star appears with the title The Great Potato Illusion and everything goes glossy. Dar winks. Opposite them is a purple velvet screen. In the background, a large potato sits inside a glass display cabinet and Harrod, also in tails, stands beside it. 
There are gestures at the screen which float slowly towards them. They twirl to the other side and push it with mind control. The screen continues on. Behold! The potato has vanished! In its place stands an unimpressed Megan, squished inside the cabinet. She presses her hand against the glass. Dar summons the screen back. A brief glimpse of the same trick in the studio space. It lacks the pizzazz. Back in glossy mode, the screen continues to move. More magic! The cabinet is empty and the potato now sits on top. Dar holds their fingers to their temples and nods. The potato flies off the cabinet. It seemed clear to us that bridges were being burned, and that made us consider our own burning bridges and smouldering fires. How does this all begin? Well, let's go back to the original idea, because this is a film of a section that we called the heist, and it starts at the beginning, which was ultimately the end for Dino, something that I would begin to lament. The heist appears in yellow capitals, Gareth, dressed in black, walks into an empty spotlit space. Hey Dee, how are you? Dino also walks into empty space. Blessed, feeling good about this one. I was in town earlier and I've basically been inspired to start up at least one new global brand and business that's going to change the landscape of this town. Right. I won't bore you with the details, but if you did want in, then I could probably offer you an unpaid internship if you met the essential criteria. What would that be? Um, well, you'd need a maths GCSE, obviously, because that's the world we live in. And, um, well, have you been known by any other previous names? No. Brilliant. You're ready to be rich, mind, aren't you? Reckon I could get us at least a grand by Christmas, both of us. Dee thinks he's an entrepreneur. He has ideas of ideas with no idea how to pull things off, and then he presents it as if it's done. There, he'll say, waiting for the check in the post. Sometimes he takes other people's ideas, thinks about them, and then regurgitates them in one long, enthusiastic belch. His ideas vary in pragmatism, and so far I've delighted in telling him how his schemes would fail to make a single penny. What do you want a grand for? I don't know, depends what day it is. Sometimes it's for a deposit on a house, or a flat, or a car. A deposit on something, somewhere to live. I've seen people do up double-decker buses and live on their mind. And is that what you want to do? Well, it's not that I particularly want to do it, but I could, couldn't I? It's just choice, isn't it? The choice of a grand. The difficulty is not in knowing what you're going to do, but why you're going to do it. I could think of loads of things to do, but I can't decide why I'd do any of them. Life is a box of chocolates, and it ain't fair trade fucking cocoa. Dee is a queer poet, but sometimes he talks like a rough nan. G tries to decipher the things I say. He left the Cubs thinking he was SAS trained. He started his special operations in school, getting expelled for stalking his French teacher. Anyway, how's you? Yeah, I'm all right. Busy, you know? Farewell tour, is it? This is a jab. Just a little one. Yeah. Anyway, I thought you weren't going to bore me. Huh? Dino smiles. G is a real doer, and sometimes he does my head in. Rehearsal footage of Gareth playing guitar. Dino grins and peace signs at the camera. Dar and Gareth are sitting together on sofas. Why are you making this? I just got very inspired to finish something that we started, I started with Dino a long time ago. And I don't know why, there, there, there's, part, there's many reasons. There was something about post-pandemic, I felt like I was done, I was a bit washed out. I kind of, maybe people would agree with that statement. But I felt like I wanted a challenge and I wanted to finish that. And I wanted to work in December and I wanted to work with people that I trusted and liked. And also, I wanted to involve Dino in some way and tell him that I was going to do it and get him talking to me about what this could be about and get him involved if he, if he wanted to. So yeah, there was a bit of a lure to get him back into this, for sure. So there was one Dino, this very important person. There are four of us. Do we amount to one Dino, the yeah. four of us? Like, what, what are we bringing? I, I needed support. <clears throat> I, I needed people around me that I could trust and I felt supported. And 
all of these people I've worked with before, and there is something in all of you that is a little bit like me in the respect that we're slightly compulsive, that we want to get something done. And all of you have got your own qualities around perfection, integrity, and skills that I just, I don't have. So I kind of needed that. And I can't make work on my own. That's why I perform, I need an audience. And that's why lots of things happen, you know, in my working relationships, but I need other people. Dino was in the other day and it was lovely to see him, but he seemed really happy from the last time I saw him, which was a while back. And he seemed really alive to be in this space. Do you think it'll be enough to bring him back? Do you think that could make a difference? Um, I think he really enjoyed coming back. And I think he really enjoyed sort of dipping his toes back in the water of what it's like to be in a studio. But there's so many things that are stacked up against him. I was just very happy to see him in the room. Looking so happy and looking so sort of relieved from some of the stresses that he's under. And I'm, they're not extraordinary stresses. We all have them. But there's something about being in a room like this in a studio that means playfulness helps us transcend some of those outside feelings that we have, I guess. Fucking hell. Did I just say that? Yeah, you did. Yeah. Do you think Dino will come back? No. I, I think the only thing that would bring him back is a guaranteed wage that would make him decide that, yeah, it was sustainable and a, and a way that he could live. But I think there would be caveats to that even. It wouldn't just... It's a bit like universal income in a way. It would be like you'd have to just give him this amount of money to be an artist, but not really put too much more on it. Yeah, and I don't think society's quite ready for those kind of radical decisions, unfortunately. You've worked with Dino, you've mentored Dino over many years, and it's been a really rich relationship. We can all see that. You know, what does it mean to you for him not to come back? I, I, I just feel sad. I feel sad about the future that we won't see him do one of those stand-up spoken word performances where he just wiped the floor with everyone. Look, it's not a competition. Art isn't about that, but I saw him do stuff at poetry events that, you know, he wasn't using classical stanzas, he was just reading from his phone and it was just so engaging, it was so brilliant, it was so touching. He talked about things that's happened in his life, about personal issues in such a beautiful, intimate way that it rolls off his tongue and into the consciousness. And I love that, I love the way you could see how people were lifted by his performances. And then when he made theatre shows and, it, you know, particularly the stuff he made it autobiographically, it just touched on such interesting points of view, but delivered in a, in a beautifully constructed way. I miss the fact that we won't see that in the future because I think the resulting work would have been really interesting and unique for Wales to have a voice like his in the mix. Gareth is back in the spotlight. Have you just looked at me and thought that I've aged? No. Then why are you looking at me like that then? Because you look knackered and I thought, well, I've been busy. I've been doing things. Why are you doing them if it ages you like that? Do you think I look old? Why would you do it to yourself? Dee always thinks there's an easier way. He was the sort of boy who never put a penny in the fountain for a wish, but dipped his hand in when no one was looking. Why do we do anything? Well, that's the question. What's your motivation? I think it's constantly changing, isn't it? Maybe that's why we never get anywhere. Famous people just want one thing. That's what we should do. We should just want one thing and then we'll get it. And then once we've got it, we can want something else until we get that thing on and on like that. Because if you want more than one thing at once, you're not committed. I don't know how you decide though, which things to want or in what order. Vape shop, classic example. My cousin-in-law opened one and all of a sudden I wanted to. Course, vape, people vape. I can sell that if he is. His ambition to make it big has meant so many things through the years. In school, he wanted to be the tallest. At graduation, he made sure he got the biggest round of applause. And now, in his pursuit for bigness, he's looking for the big time. Do you know what I mean? Well, in a way. I mean, I sometimes want to do everything. that I want to be the one that's doing that. G wants to start a cult and be the leader. I'm not saying he'd be unfair. I'm sure he'd let other people have a go sometimes, but they'd have to take on his name and shave their heads. And I realise I can't do everything. And I realise that more and more as I get older. Why can't you do it? I haven't got the time, tired, physically you can't do it, knackered, I haven't got the skills. Well, the idea of doing something is one thing, but then the actual doing of it is something completely different, isn't it? I mean, for example, I've always wanted to write a book, but could I? 
Probably not. Unless you went to prison. Everyone writes books in prison. And it's the same for all the other things that I want to do. You're trapped, but I'm optimistic. We could write a Christmas song. People write one song and it's a hit every Christmas for the rest of their lives. And they just live off it. Do they? Yeah. And when they're away just somewhere living off it, they're doing everything they want to do. They've done their big bit. And then they can just relax and experience life without worrying about anything. In all of his dreams, he thinks he's getting closer to his true self. When he gets there, he'll see that it's someone very small. I don't know. I'm not sure about the Christmas song idea. G says he wants to be part of something bigger, something meaningful. What's more meaningful than Christmas? He wants to be involved in everything, to have his say, make sure everything's fair. He thinks he's a people person, but he hates most people. He says he's looking for people to share ideas with, his ideas. He's found himself, and now he's going to thrust it on a group of people, easily persuaded people. In focused light, Gareth reads from his laptop. The art wasn't always obvious. It didn't need to be obvious. Sometimes it felt like it needed to provoke or poke or stimulate more softly, but it never felt like it needed to be obvious. When we climbed steps together, our legs would take the strain and in that action, we were occupied in the labor of climbing. An occupation that freed us and held us. Constraint was the element that became problematic, perhaps, because the labor needed more reward. In creating art, you allowed the brush strokes to mix colors and shapes together. The textures could be abstract, and yet the poignancy hung in the air like a river mist. And I saw people inhale deeply and sigh and smile in sequence. When pushed, I wondered which path you would take. You were pushed. Something pushed you. Or did you jump? Okay, pause. We're gonna have to leave Gareth gazing at the words on his laptop because I need some time for this next section. What is about to take place is a text-to-speech reading of Dino's description of part of the 1959 film Solomon and Sheba. During the description, Dar and Megan stand behind matching green boards. They post their hands through letterbox-shaped holes and move them to represent two women being described whilst Gareth observes from a distance. Megan then sits at a table and wheels out two tiny trays from behind a small screen. Dar changes what appears on the trays. Sometimes it is a potato or two potato halves which are then interchanged with a baby doll. The doll is fought over and Megan wins. The two back away behind their green boards as Ankarad appears behind them holding a bow saw high in the air. The scene is mixed with shots of Dino and Gareth performing the same gestures and movements taken from their own rehearsals of this piece in 2018. Now I think we're ready. This is Solomon's story. A woman with an orange headscarf holds her hands to explain the situation that brings her and the woman with a leather belt here today. There is a guard that stands between them holding a white bundle. Orange woman is upset. Leather woman has a hard face. The man on the big golden chair does a lot of active listening by holding his staff across his chest and shaking it. His breath is very controlled because he's been told in the past that it is distracting to hear. The orange woman moves her hands more and the leather woman starts to wave hers in an interrupting manner and a voice from somewhere else silences them both. Orange headscarf woman picks up her desperate plea much quieter and the leather woman frowns before the man on the golden chair and then he holds up his staff and they are quiet. The man in the middle of the frame carries the bundle to the center of the shot and another guard takes it off him carefully and puts it on the floor ordered by the man on the golden chair. Gina Lolo Brigida looks unimpressed by the whole thing in a blue dress that she wears partly over her head. 
The guard unwraps the baby and we see that it is a boy and he steps back looking at him on the floor. The man in the golden chair tells the guard to cut the baby in half and the guard takes out his sword straight away. Gina Lolo Brigida looks slightly to her left. My right dark she then looks back at the guard as the baby coos and he raises his sword. At that moment then, the orange scarf woman throws herself onto the baby and a noise escapes her. The man on the golden chair respects her, gives her the baby, and punches the other woman. Gina is impressed and says how wise he is to give this baby to the orange woman and send the leather woman to jail. And he says, real wisdom lies in the ability to decide between the true and the false. Left alone in the space, two large potatoes rest on the table. I saw something earlier that was shocking. Oh. I wish I could show you, but then I would have had to have paid for it. Honestly, right? I was walking through Newport Food Market, loads of overpriced stuff. Hummus for four quid. Yeah, that sort of thing. And I kept on seeing kids and adults. All ages. And they were walking around with these huge long sticks with this weird spirally thing on it. Yeah. Well, ask me what's on the stick. What's a It's a potato. Gareth is unfazed. A potato. Ask me how much it was for this potato. How much was? 265. 265? For one potato on one stick? Yeah. But it's been cooked, it's been cut up, it's got flavouring on it, and then it's been fried. All right, yeah, but what's that? That's a bag of crisps on a stick. Would you buy a tiny bag of crisps stacked up on a stick like that? The potato was probably the size of my fist. No, probably smaller because I've got incredibly long thumbs which bulk my fists out. I reckon they were the size of baby potatoes. Little new baby salad potatoes, something like that. All stretched out. It's quite amusing watching Dee get vexed over something so small. It's shocking. People pay enough for that and they were happy about it. Smiling buying them, smiling eating them. Disgusting. But I will say it was the cheapest thing there. That's why they were happy. Because Potato Man was ripping them off a bit less than Hummus Man. Well, they priced it right then. And it was good that there was something cheaper for people. And the person selling them, well, he wouldn't have made that much money. What do you mean that much? 2 65 per one. You can get a sack of potatoes for three pound. He's making a massive profit. D gets angry about numbers. I haven't got a GCSE in maths, but you don't need a PhD to see the numbers for what they are. Okay. Well, you don't have to buy them, do you? If you think they cost too much, don't buy them. No, I don't have to buy them, but I could sell them. But I thought they outraged you. Oh, they do. But if I was selling them, I'd be happy about it. Why? Massive profit, numbers. If you're happy to pay that money, then go on, give it to me. If you're willing to part with 265 for a potato on a stick, I'll gladly provide the stick and I chuck the potato on top. So you would do the ripping off? Well, that's life, isn't it? That's the only real choice. Be exploited or exploit. I don't like that this is the system I'm in, but I'm too tall to live on a bus. I just want to do my bit so then I can just live my life without worrying about the system that's making me blind, starving and unsatisfied. Gareth raises his eyebrows. From now on, it's potatoes on sticks. Be mugged off or do the mug in. Rehearsal footage. Gareth is setting up his laptop by a mixing desk. Dino settles behind a microphone. Gareth sits next to him. What's the first line? What's the song called? Strike a mat. So what's the first line? Strike a mat. Dino's smile wanes and he strokes his chin, eyes flicking to the others as they play the intro. He mouths, what's the first line, to Gareth who replies. Dino holds his face and laughs. 
Dara and Gareth are back on the sofas. So you made fear in, I think, was it 2016? Fear was predominantly about the fear of ageing and the fear of dying. We're the same age. We're both middle-aged people and neither of us have children. I wonder if, if your feelings about Dean or which are the reason you've made this show, are about he was meant to be your legacy, you know? Is he not your legacy? <laughs> no, that's and he's ruined it? far no? too fucking sentimental. Absolutely yeah. not. No, no, not at all. Snap to rehearsal footage. Gareth and Dino gaze into each other's eyes over a shared mic. They grin. But he ultimately represents a whole cohort of people that had dreams and are not fulfilling them because there's barriers and there's something stopping that, that next development phase. And fundamentally, when he came out of university, I presume like a lot of people in the last 20 years, they come out with a massive debt around their neck. Now, some people can just brush that off and say, that doesn't matter, I'll never pay that back. But for other people, that's huge. And uh, that's not giving anyone a fair chance to start a new career in something as precarious as the fucking art. It's been a crazy few years with COVID and lots of other personal things going on. Is this show about more than Dino, more than Dino leaving the arts in, in terms yeah. of those things? Do you yeah, want to I think talk so. about that a bit? Not really. No. It's quite painful, some of that. Yeah, sure. Lots of things have changed. And of course, what happens is relationships end and friendships end. And that seemed to come into really stark focus over the last few years. And I was reeling in 2016 from us as a nation deciding that we wanted to leave the European Union. I was reeling in 2016 from people like Donald Trump getting elected, you know, reeling from these kind of political decisions. But also I feel like it's affected people in so many different ways. And yeah, um, yeah, you know more than anyone, this year has been super tough for me. And um, I've been smacked in the face with, with some of those things. And yeah, I think, I think for us then as creatives, it's, I'm interested in how people share their stories, for sure. And uh, yeah, Dino has become a bit of a conduit for some of those things that I've lost, yeah. Thanks, Gar. Good chat. Let's crack on. Yep, cool. Head lowered, he watches Dar go, then turns to us. Sometimes I feel like I just say too much, like it just falls out of my mouth and I haven't really thought about it. Sorry. And after <laughs> those sorts of conversations, then... Uh, Megan appears. I don't know. I mean, what was that? You just dribbled on quite a lot. I mean, some of it was quite poetic. I'll give you that. This is Megan. Uh, Megan's an actor, and right now Megan is playing my inner voice. It was a bit shit. I mean, it wasn't fully shit, but it was quite long. There might be editing. There'll have to be a lot of editing. Megan's enjoying the role of being my inner voice. I mean, they have trained after all. Where did you train? Megan could have been an elf in Swindon today, but instead they're working with me on this project. Yeah. I regret that. Hmm. Better get on. He leaves. Megan gazes into space and flicks her head dismissively. Another white aging man just talking about himself. She sighs and gracelessly rolls off the back of the sofa. Gareth is alone with his laptop, behind a mic. If you ask me something, I would answer. Yellow capitals, the exchange, hang over Dara and Megan, who sit with potatoes at a table. The coherence of the answer may depend on the question in hand. The answer or the response would be fairly, if not completely, instantaneous. Dar places a ukulele on a raised platform, which stands on the table between them. Megan pays with two potatoes beneath. Dar nods and takes the potatoes. You speak and leave a space. And I fill in the space with some words in line with the inquiry you've made. Megan takes the ukulele and rummages in a sack by her feet. I said, you said, or you said, I said. She puts a megaphone on the platform. Dar delicately places two potatoes beneath. Megan adds them to her pile. They both stand as Dar takes the megaphone. The words were sometimes deep or rich with truth and emotion. The words were sometimes scathing and harsh and impregnated with a cheek full of tongue. 
whatever the words, they flowed with honesty, an openness that was infectious. Two of us swimming in the freedom of expression that our connection enabled. Megan digs through her sack, searching for an item to exchange for a long rusty nail Dar has positioned on the platform. She sets a green leaf satsuma next to it. Sometimes, in the bright lights, I was exposed. They each take their prize. Not by the words uttered, by something more revealing, by the actions of doing something. Exposure, or feeling exposed, is not always a comfortable place to be. As Satsuma joins a cuddly toy. In fact, I had learned from childhood to avoid it. Da adds a small potato below, in addition to the Satsuma above. A nod of agreement, and Megan takes it, followed by the Satsuma as Da accepts the toy. And yet here, in our age gap, in our radical differences, in our intent to breathe a new oxygen that illuminated an aliveness, we found our friendship. On the platform, Dara arranges a black and white framed photo of a man. Megan considers and places a medium sized potato beneath. Dar raises their eyebrows. Megan concedes and adds a small new potato. As a second thought, she quickly includes another. Dar smiles, nods, and takes them. And in that friendship, I found hope and worth and perhaps a slumbering paternal instinct or a desire to nurture that lay alongside the inspiration and possibility that surrounded me when you were here. The two delicately place their exchanged items and potatoes into sacks. In unison, they stand and shoulder them, smile at each other, then leave in opposite directions. Darkness. Gareth slowly comes into focus. I heard you before you left. I heard the words you said, carefully constructed, rehearsed even. I was complicit after all, to all of the plans and ideas, the hopes and glories of future successes and critical kickings. Now what? You've gone. I could say every decision is made, constructed from the raw material of experience, from the conscious and unconscious, from the make-believe of our own minds. How do you know what impact any decision can really have? We cannot measure the success and failure of our decisions because the variables are too inconsistent and they behave differently under close scrutiny. And yet we make decisions without thinking all the time in a blink, in a whisper, in a breath. Great big fucking decisions that will forever change the course of our lives. You've just made another one, and another. All I know is, you left, I stayed. You went and I waited. You made up your mind. I made up my mind based on the way you made up your mind. Why does this matter? because it is another union that has dissolved, slipped away, and as the years move forward, I've become ever so sharply focused on the things that have stopped, ended abruptly, reminded of the pain and sense of loss. We have our truths, many versions of the same thing. How can I say to you that mine are any greater than yours? I miss you. I will miss you. I will. He pensively closes his laptop and regards it through heavy eyes. The band. Build 
a pie up for you To take your memories To burn your secrets for good They build a pie up for you The stack is getting higher They'll burn you more than they should with our lives and find our paths and sometimes they cross and sometimes in moments of real clarity we dance. Megan, Dar and Gareth stand in a triangle on the empty dance floor of the studio and Carrot paces in and positions herself at the back. She notices the others smart in their boiler suits and hastily pulls the top of hers up. Unity dance appears in yellow capitals. The group moves methodically together, facing forwards but striding sideways across the floor, arms at their sides. They jump to a halt, then retreat in the same sideways fashion. With stiff legs, they penguin walk in a semicircle and stomp to a close. They check the soles of their feet, as if for dog poo, then sidestep with angular arms before gathering behind each other in a line, which cautiously slides across the floor. Two dancers swish their knees, whilst the other two press their cheeks sideways. They step apart and advance in unison once more. They move purposely to face one side of the room, then the other, raising one leg backwards in a suspended balance. They stamp in an exaggerated march before once more striding sideways. With shuffling steps, they turn, then walk towards the back wall using the marching steps to face forwards once more. Arms raised at an angle, they lunge forwards and back before repeating the sideways retreat. They check the poo again, then shuffle to closely face each other in two pairs. Megan's head to Gareth's chest, arms held in a strange tango. They advance, pause, then hinge out like double doors, outside arms held horizontally, their inner arms touching above their heads. They raise their outer legs to make an irregular star shape, then separate. Behind them, Darren and Harrod follow the same moves, opening out to form a more even star. The camera glides between their bodies as Gareth and Megan come together and tango once more. They pull their star shape, eyes fixed ahead, snap their hands to the sides and march away. The company are on a break. Your care for Dino, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Like you're, you're more invested in whether he wants to play with us. Like me and Meg, I think I can speak for you. I'm not bothered either way. Like if he wants to join in, fine. If he doesn't, fine. But um, you, you really care. You have a lot of care for him. 
we'd say things like, are we going to do this cabaret that goes on for 10 hours? Do you, will you be in it? And you went, yeah. And it was just like, oh yeah, you're, you're, you're one of us. <laughs> yeah. And I think that maybe is it. Maybe there's the freaks. It's like, I get disappointed when people give up their vegan diet or their vegetarian mm. diet. And they go, oh, I ate a bit of bacon. I feel disappointed in them. <laughs> and now Dino's <laughs> gone to the dark side of, you yeah. know, got a mortgage and a job. And, and I get the sense no, I that you feel that our generation should feel a sense of responsibility. No, I... That you want to, like, leave a little gap for Dino to come yeah, back through. Yeah. Da, Gareth and Megan stand stiffly in a line. Two bright lights shine behind them. A potato sits on the floor next to Da. And Harrod adjusts Megan's boiler suit, gives the other two a once-over and leaves. Okay. Set. Action. Yellow capitals read, the largest blaze. The largest blaze can start from the smallest spark. A spark that could so easily have been snuffed out by a sneezing mouse. A spark that could be blown out by the gentle breeze from the wing of a butterfly launching from the stamen of a dahlia. The spark would have to, in a single moment, Catch a lone sheet of paper or a collection of waste items dried in the sun and flammable by nature. The spark would have to seize the opportunity to reach something incendiary and quickly convince that said item to take on a flame. Negotiation time would be limited. I sometimes wonder if the lint in my belly button might combust into flames. The spark becomes flame, and even then the flame is vulnerable. Like a starving chick, it needs feeding and it needs it fast. The flame stretches the reach of the spark and grows a little more resilient under the right conditions. The flame laps more gently and more persistently at possible colluding objects and materials. The flame licks more seductively and can be irresistible. The flame grows hypnotically, its prey is weakened. The flame excites. The flame becomes fire, a fire. The fire can still be fragile, can still be subject to burnout. But with careful persuasion, the fire can become all-encompassing. The fire can reach and react. The fire can sense its strength. And when the heat rises, the fire draws breath and spreads. The fire can rage and make everything a swirl of colour with amazing shapes that get larger and more seductive. The fire is alight, the spark has taken, the flame matured and the result is glorious. And for its intense time the fire is all. Glorious, destructive, damning and grave and you watch as it grows. And, and like, like a dog, dog you don't, don't know how, how to handle, handle. You, you freeze as it licks you all over. over. The camera pans backwards as the image fades to darkness. Gareth and Dino are back in their spotlights. Are you ready? For what? We got them? Yeah. Is this... This is it. Is this, this is the time, for the truth? I thought we dispelled the idea of truth, that the whole point was there is no truth. You're a conspiracy theorist. Everything's fake news to you. You think there's no such thing as truth, and that means people get away with things. Gareth blinks. Dino shakes his head. Whatever. Are you ready? A flash of Gareth standing alone in the space, then darkness. Lights brighten as Gareth saunters into shot. Did you enjoy that? A little bit of art, did you? <laughs> well, I've got some potatoes on sticks to sell. They're five pounds each, but because it's you and I'll have to post them, it'll be five pound fifty. But you'll get a potato and you'll get a stick. But if you wanted to pay a little bit more and support the arts and the artists a little bit more, you could do that. You could pay what you can. I don't know what you can pay. I'm not pressing you, times are hard. I'm just kind of glad you watched it. And if I saw you in the street, I'd give you one of these. He leans in for five pounds and walks away. A 
shot of the air conditioning unit over which appears the title, Relighting a Very Nice Fire. Written and produced by Gareth Clark. Original material, Gareth Clark, Dino Rovaretti. Performed by Megan Brooks, Gareth Clark, Dar, and Harold Matthews and Dino Rovaretti. A film by Jonathan Dunn. Costume and props, and Harold Matthews. Original set design, Tim Spooner. Audio description, Megan Brooks. Live music engineer, Mikey Krupa Gregory. A raw material production. Supported by Arts Council Wales, The Riverfront Newport, Tin Shed Theatre Company, Das Clarks and Lala Babylon Land. Jonathan Dunn.net Media Production.